Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Keating Chambers webinar on current hot topics in public procurement. I'm David Gollance, and I have the pleasure of chairing the webinar and introducing the speakers, Sarah Hannaford QC, Fanula McCready QC, Simon Taylor and Rachel O'Hagan. The talks will run roughly 20 minutes each and we will have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. You can submit questions during the talks by opening the Q&A box, which is one of the tabs in the box you should see along the bottom of your screen and typing and submitting your question on the right hand side of your screen. Our first talk is given by Fanula McCready QC and Rachel Hagen about the 2019 rail franchising litigation in which they successfully defended the fat controller against a veritable profusion of allegations and indeed alligators emerging bloodied and not only unbowed but triumphant. Uh, the judgment runs to some 193 pages, so I'm sure we will all be very grateful to Fanula and Rachel for summarising it in an elegant 20 minutes. I do commend to you the judge's observation in paragraph 95 that when talking about legal advice, the Secretary of State is not and does not profess to be a lawyer. He is there, of course, referring to the Secretary of State, Chris Grayling, lately the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. I do also commend the first 24 pages of the judgment as a survey of the European law principles underlying public procurement law. They would, in my view, serve as an admirable introductory primer on the subject for any junior lawyer uh, who is introducing themselves to public procurement. And with that, Fenula and Rachel, over to you. Good morning, everybody, um, and a warm welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. This is a case about railways, specifically rail franchising competitions. Um, it's also a case about pensions and the defined benefit private pension scheme enjoyed by those employed on the railways. Next slide, please, Marie. Um, by way of background, in 2018, uh, the Department for Transport was competing the West Coast, East Midlands and South East rail franchise competitions. The railway pension scheme is, as I've said, a shared cost defined benefit private scheme, which is currently under investigation by the pensions regulator um, over funding levels. Rail franchisees are responsible for the employer contributions to the scheme during the currency of a franchise. Um, the TRP investigation caused uncertainty about the future level, the level of future pension contributions which are required, would be required for individual rail franchises to make to the TRP pension section. Um, in response to that uncertainty, the Department for Transport devised and offered a defined, albeit limited, pensions risk sharing mechanism for those current rail franchise competitions. Next slide, please, Marie. The case arose because the claimants refused to accept the DFT risk sharing mechanism and offered instead to contract on different terms, which involved the risk being borne by the government and not by rail franchisees. The ITT provided that a non-compliant bid could be rejected and the bidder disqualified at the sole discretion of the Secretary of State. Having bid in the way that they did, the claimants were duly disqualified by the Secretary of State for failing to accept his allocation of pensions risk um, as prescribed by um, the ITTs in the competitions uh, and the specific instructions that related to rail pensions. Next slide, please, Marie. Um, Arriva, Stagecoach and Virgin challenged their disqualification in um, extensively publicised proceedings which began in Mar May and June of last year. There were four claimants, uh, the West Coast Train Partnership, the principal components of which were Virgin and Stagecoach, Stagecoach Southeastern Trains, Stagecoach East Midlands Trains and Arriva Rail East Midlands, although that case subsequently settled. Next slide, please, Marie. Um, there were voluminous pleadings with amendments, but in essence, they boiled down to the propositions on the slide. The claimants challenged the 
um, breaches, a claim that the, the uh, ITT and the decision to disqualify uh, and numerous other um, steps in the procurement were breaches of the rail regulation 1370 um, article 4. Uh, that article requires that services um, be defined and parameters for compensation be defined to prevent overcompensation. Um, and uh, Article 5.3, which requires fair competitive tendering and an observance of the principles of transparency and non-discrimination. And finally, um, they challenged on the basis of EU principles of proportionality, equal treatment and non-transparency. And transparency. Um, I'm going to turn over to Rachel O'Hagan now. Um, Rachel was the excellent senior junior on the claim by Stagecoach Southeastern Trains, and she's going to explain um, the case management or how we got this juggernaut to trial in a mere seven months. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Fanula. Um, so I'm going to take just a few moments to discuss some of the practical case management issues which arose during this litigation. I will discuss firstly the court case management, secondly, the confidentiality arrangements, thirdly, some of the major applications, and lastly, how we manage the litigation. So turning first to the court case management, this piece of litigation was both huge and complex. The litigation comprised four part seven claims and four judicial review claims. The JRs were subsequently stayed. There were six interested parties. The various actions were case managed together, but remained separate actions. Now, not only was this litigation both huge and complex, but the proceedings were also expedited. As Fanula mentioned a moment ago, the proceedings commenced around May 2009, uh, 2019. Sorry, uh, The first CMC was on the 20th of June. The trial commenced some seven months later on the 20th of January earlier this year, and the trial was listed for three weeks. Um, the trial is listed for three weeks. Um, at that point in time, the court ordered that there should be an expedited trial um, the, the court ordered that there should be an expedited trial. Two of the franchise competitions that were subject to challenge were still live. So in other words, no decision had been taken by the defendant to contract with one of the non-disqualified bidders. However, subsequently and prior to the commencement of the trial, one of those competitions were cancelled and in the other competition, a contract had been awarded. Unsurprisingly, in order to achieve the expedited trial timetable, the court actively case managed the litigation. Now, some of these steps included uh, a period of weekly CMCs. In fact, there were 12 CMCs from around June to July 2019, and some of them were a whole day or even two days. In practice, this meant at that juncture that a significant proportion of the working week was taken up with preparing for and attending the CMCs. The court subsequently limited the disclosure that was required. On the 28th of June, the court had ordered that there would be standard disclosure. However, as one of the steps towards trial in January 2020, the defendant applied to limit the scope of disclosure that it was required to give. Uh, this concession was sought and obtained on the express ground that if the relief was not given, the trial date would be jeopardised. So it was on that basis that the parties proceeded with a more limited form of disclosure. Uh, also, in order to meet the expedited trial timetable, the scope of the trial was limited to what became known by the parties as the pensions issues. And Fanula has touched on that just a moment ago. So turning now to confidentiality. Unsurprisingly, there were also complex confidentiality issues due to the number of stakeholders uh, affected by the litigation. For example, there were different types of confidential documentation that required consideration. This included, for example, documents from interested parties. Uh, this information was particularly sensitive because the rail market is so tight and very competitive. And understandably, train companies were concerned that their competitors should not have access to their confidential and sensitive information. There were also confidential documents from the uh, Department of Transport for consideration. And this includes, for example, documents relating to the direct award of the Southeastern franchise. Uh, lastly, there were documents also from third parties, um, and this included uh, documents from the pensions regulator and, all way, and also the railways pensions scheme. Now, this created a very real and time consuming layer of complexity to the disclosure arrangements, which had a knock on effect on preparation of witness statements, trial preparation and bundle production. 
In order to accommodate the confidentiality considerations, initially there were franchise specific confidentiality rings. Uh, however, subsequently, unfortunately, a common confidentiality ring was ultimately agreed between the parties. However, even after the ring had been established, there were further practical considerations for the hearing. So that the documents were easily identifiable and were not inadvertently referred to in open court, the confidential documents were labelled as tier one and confidential. And in the event that a witness was taken to those documents during cross-examination, everyone except for the people that were, win were within tier one of the confidentiality ring were asked to leave court and the session was heard in camera. Uh, there were also major applications. Um, this included a two day uh, strikeout application made by the defendant and a subsequent three day appeal hearing in the Court of Appeal and an unsuccessful injunction application by West Coast to prevent the Secretary of State awarding the West Coast franchise to first. Um, moving on now to how did we deal with all of this? Um, Marie, if we could move to uh, the next slide, please. Well, we put together what might be described as a super team to manage the litigation. The team was headed up by two marvellous QCs, of which Fanula was obviously one of them, uh, GLD and a senior junior. The layer, this was the layer of the legal team which managed the litigation as a whole. For each of the four individual cases, there was a separate law firm, um, a separate senior junior to manage the case specific issues and a junior junior assisting with the documents and witness statements. There were also then junior juniors assisting in matter, uh, with common matters across the four competitions. Um, we had an electronic bundle. This had its pros and cons. Aside from having to buy new computers that were fast enough to accommodate the bundles, uh, we had to organise ourselves within a very short period of time to agree tagging trees and other ways to organise the documentation so that we could use them for the purposes of cross-examination. Uh, it's fair to say that the management of this litigation was a mammoth task, but if I may say so, it was incredibly well managed by our leaders, Fanula and Rodri. I now hand you back to Fanula. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and I should say to everybody that Rachel was an absolutely fantastic junior who gave me tremendous support um, and uh, made it a much more pleasurable exercise uh, than it would otherwise have been. So moving on to the result. Um, in a very thorough and considered judgment, which ran, as um, David said, to 193 pages, which I am, am told uh, is longer than the first two Harry Potter novels, apparently. Um, and I have to say, it's uh, for my own um, view, uh, it was a read which was just as riveting. Um, anyway, we were successful and the Secretary of State was successful on every issue. There is a lot of law in the judgment and much of interest for procurement lawyers, for both uh, acting for challenges and contracting authorities alike. It's quite hard to condense this into 10 minutes, um, in fact, nine minutes and 17 seconds. Um, but giving a credit to and a recommendation to the excellent Lawtel summary um, in Lawtel of 25th of June, I'm going to try and give you the key points um, of the judgment, starting with the question whether the ITT terms governing non-compliance and disqualification breach the duties of transparency and fairness. Um, it, it was alleged that the ITT terms were unlawful, obviously, um, but the judge found that the ITT terms re non-compliance were lawful clearly stated and admitted of no misunderstanding by a rewind tenderer. And in another paragraph, he said that the ITT was clear, precise and unequivocal. He also said um, that terms um, relating to the contractual allocation of risk are subject to a wide margin of appreciation because they are the contractual um, realisation um, of the manifestation of policy decisions which are taken about the allocation of public resources uh, and for obvious reasons those are in the remit of the public authority ha who has to make decisions about how they should allocate those resources. In relation to discretion um, and in particular the words sole discretion he said that um, that has to be exercised both in the factual context but also rationally and in accordance with policy, uh, and that the exercise of discretion cannot be arbitrary, unlimited or capricious. Uh, and he relied upon Telefonica 02 in that respect. Uh, and so um, 
although sole discretion were the words that were used, that sole discretion had to be exercised in the wider context of EU and uh, UK law. Um, and so he found that the ITT terms were um, lawful. Moving on to the wide margin of appreciation of a contracting authority. Um, it was alleged by the claimants that the imposition of uncertain pensions risks on rail franchisees was um, unlawful and was in breach of the rail regulation and the obligations of transparency and fairness. The judge found that there was no principle of EU or UK law that limited the size of a risk that could be allocated to one contracting party or another in a, a public procurement. Um, he said that uncertainty was um, a feature of every public procurement and particularly large ones. And like any other uh, risk, uncertainty of outcome was a risk that could be estimated and priced as could any other risk. M moving on to the next slide, um, please, Marie. Um, it was also alleged by the um, claimants that the allocation of exogenous risk to bidders was unlawful. Um, by exogenous risk, they mean risk which was outside their control. Um, and of course, uh, what they said was that the pensions regulators' conclusions were as yet unknown and might need lead to the requirement for um, further funding of the railways pension scheme, potentially very significant further funding. Um, and the, the reference to exogenous risk refers back to the, the Brown review, rail review, um, which arose out of the uh, uh, collapse of the West Coast mainline rail franchise back in 2012. However, Brown didn't find that uh, exogenous risks, which were, which were um, related to cost, sh should be um, kept away from uh, rail franchisees. Um, so um, he also found, the judge also found that this was no barrier to um, cross-border competition. And, he, and it, as a matter of fact, there was very substantial transnational involvement in the competition. Um, so it had not acted as, as a deterrent and that there were compliant bidders who included Trenitalia, who were Italian, um, uh, Abellio, uh, uh, and um, uh, so there was a, a you know, pan-European and even um, Keolis, which is part owned by um, uh, a Canadian uh, entity. So there was no evidence that it had stopped anybody bidding. And he also found that stagecoach could have bid compliantly at a level that would have given them protection with which they were comfortable. And finally, he said that in fact, stagecoach were not prevented from participation. They chose not to participate and to bid on different terms. Moving on, Marie, to the next slide, please. Um, um, so uh, it was alleged that the disqualification decisions were unlawful because the DFT had used a non-compliance log, um, which was a large spreadsheet, which inserted every single non-compliance on the particular franchise um, and which um, bidder it, uh, that it was attributed to. And then it used a system of ranking or marking the extent of the, of the um, non-compliance, i.e. trivial was one and serious was a four or five. It was used not to evaluate those non-compliances, but as an administrative tool to ensure that trivial breaches, like, breach, like non-compliances, were treated in the same way. Um, and the claimant said, well, that wasn't published and therefore that was a breach of your obligations of transparencies. Um, the judge held that the contracting authority is generally not obliged to divulge its system of marking or its evaluation methodology, um, provided that it uh, publishes and makes clear and follows its evaluation criteria. And he further found that the contracting authority has a margin of leeway in the way it carries out its task, provided that it doesn't change the award criteria. Uh, and he found that the contracting authority was entitled to use a non-compliance matrix, which was not disclosed to bidders as an administrative tool, which was irrelevant to the exercise of discretion. And there is a case called TLS Di Marso, uh, which is supportive of that, which is prior to the rail judgment. Um, he also found that the, the major difficulty really with the, with the claimant's case was that the objections to the other courses of actions, which they said were open to the Secretary of State, um, led inexorably to the conclusion that disqualification was the proper exercise of discretion. So what he actually meant was 
But in circumstances where you have bidders who had bid compliantly, so they were set an exam script and they answered the question. If you were to change the rules of the competition for a bidder who didn't answer the exam question and decided they wanted to answer a different one, that would be a breach of equal treatment. If you were to change the rules of the competition to um, accommodate a non-compliant bidder. Um, so, uh, and then the court went on to say the judgments, the judge found that it, a court would only interfere with the exercise of discretion if it was manifestly inappropriate. And in the circumstances where there were compliant bidders who'd followed the rules, it would be um, the, the exercise of discretion uh, inexorably led to the disqualification decision. So the reasons for the uh, disqualification, moving quickly on. Um, can, next slide, please, Marie. Um, the judge, the claimants alleged that the letters, nine pages or eight or nine pages le letters that they were written um, uh, explaining their disqualification and the reasons for it uh, were unlawful because they weren't sufficiently clear and transparent. And the judge found in terms that the reasons and reasoning in the disqualification letters was concise, clear and sufficient, and they enabled the claimants to know that they were disqualified for a serious non-compliance on pensions. And the reasons were sufficient both for a rewind tenderer and for the claimants. And finally, that they um, were sufficient for the court to exercise its supervisory jurisdiction. Next slide, please, Marie. Um, financial robustness test. The Department of Transport carried out a financial robustness test on bids in a process that was described in detail in the ITT. Um, that was criticised by the claimants on the basis that it wasn't sufficiently um, wide in scope as to test every possible outcome. Um, the judge found that there was no EU or UK requirement to carry out a financial robustness test, but if, it, what, if it, one was carried out, it, the test had to be clearly set out and adhered to. Um, he said that the financial robustness test was limited and that was transparent from the ITT. The Secretary of State was entitled to de determine the extent of any robustness testing he wished to put in place and nothing in the ITT imposed an obligation on him to conduct an FRT that gave total um, assurance. Next slide, please. And then finally, and we're on the home straight and I'm sorry that I'm overrunning, um, the judge found that, that it was um, lawful for the Secretary of State to rely upon an additional report that had not been envisaged in the ITT, which related to a decision whether or not to continue or abandon the procurements. They um, obtained an analysis from PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, which looked at whether or not uh, bidders would remain robust if various downside pension risks materialised. Um, the DFT was clear that the purpose of the analysis was to determine whether or not to continue or abandon, and it was entirely separate from any evaluation, financial robustness test, or decision to disqualify. Moving on to the penultimate slide, Marie. And the judge said that there was no provision in the ITT and no principle of EU or UK law that required a decision to cancel to be taken solely on the basis of information generated by the terms of the ITT. And as a matter of fact, he held that the PWC analysis was used solely to inform that decision of whether to cancel or proceed. Um, he said it would have been unlawful to add the PCC analysis as a criterion, but that was not what had in fact happened. And finally, in conclusion, um, as I next slide, please, Marie. Um, this was, as I've said, a resounding victory for the DFT and the Secretary of State on every um, issue raised by the claimants. It contains as David said, a very useful introductory primer and useful restatements and clarifications of the margin of appreciation afforded to contracting authorities. Um, and the fundamental point was that the claimant's decision to reject the pensions risk and to bid on different terms meant that it would have been a breach of the requirements of equal treatment to do anything other than disqualify when other bidders had accepted that risk. Thank you very much for listening and back to you, David. Thank you, Fanula and Rachel. That was an extraordinarily uh, clear and, and concise summary of a very long and complex case. Um, I have to say, I think anybody who is called upon to defend decisions made by Chris Grayling deserves some sort of medal. Um, anyone who undertakes claimant procurement litigation will know that it is seldom the case that a contracting authority only does one thing wrong. Generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that as disclosure happens or even when you see the defence, it's often, if not usually, the case that the causes of action accumulate like parking tickets on a stolen BMW. Uh, 
And you have to decide whether to issue fresh proceedings, apply to amend, or possibly to try and sneak your further allegations in as voluntary further particulars. Simon Taylor has recently emerged victorious from a dispute uh, as to whether he could introduce further allegations, and he is going to talk us through the issues that arose there. Simon. David, thank you very much. I, I wasn't actually victorious on this one. I was, I was for, um, I'm going to talk about accessible orthodontics in NHS England. And I, was, I was for the defendant on, on this one, but um, uh, nevertheless, I'm very happy to talk about the case and, and we'll do so. I, I'm going to talk about the, the perennial problem that claimants have, which is that, um, and if you could move the slides forward, Marie, the perennial problem that when, when a claimant begins its, its claim, it doesn't really know very much about what happened in the procurement. The, the, the onion is unpeeled then over a, over a series of rounds of disclosure, often prior to the CMC, and the claimant learns more, more and more about its case. But, but it's already issued proceedings and it's already set out in its, in its first particulars what the nature of its claim is. And the, 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 the claimant is, is often well advised to, to make the claim form and, and the particulars, if possible, as broad as possible and, and, and make allegations by inference where, where appropriate. But nevertheless, new things do arise. And the question which then arises is whether, whether they are, as David says, new causes of action or whether they're further particulars of, of the existing case. And one or the other will determine the, the, the correct treatment from a limitation point of view. So the, as you're all aware, I put on the slide the 30-day uh, the, the period in relation to, to limitation for new causes of action. The, um, and then the, the CPR 17.1 rule, which is that, that in as far as the, uh, the claimant seeks to, uh, to amend it, its pleading, then it, then it can either obtain the consent of the, uh, of the defendant or, or the permission of, of the court. But the, the, the challenge is whether to seek to amend or whether to issue a, a new claim with, with every new allegation that emerges from the disclosure. And certainly, the, Mr Justice Fraser in the SRCL case gave, gave the steer that it's, that it's not unusual in procurement cases to have three or four or more claims issued. And, and this is a well-known and, and practiced approach. But the alternative approach, of course, is to amend the existing claim. And the benefit of that is that it's more cost efficient. You don't have to, to, um, to pay for a new issue fee and you don't have to consolidate, consolidate various claims into one. So what this talk really about is, is, is how the court approaches the, 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 the uh, applications to amend where the claimant chooses this as, as the best way forward. And I've got 17.4 um up on the on this slide and the, so the first question is whether this is applicable at all to to um procurement cases and you'll see there that this this is the test where where uh, a limitation period has expired the um if you just go back to that to that one uh, marie the, the the test where where a limitation period has expired under either the limitation at 1980 or another enact enactment which allows such an amendment to take place after a limitation period has expired. So the question is whether this is applicable to procurement cases. And if it is, then the, um, the, the similar facts test applies. So if you move on to the next slide. And, it, and in my view, the answer is that 17.4 is not applicable to, to procurement cases. It, it's, always, it's always been accepted in cases like DWF and, and even in, in perinatal against HCRIP that 17.4 was applicable, the Limitation Act did apply. But Mr. Justice Jefford, in that case, she, she expressed some reservations uh, about that simply because the limitation rule doesn't arise under the Limitation Act. It arises under the, the procurement regulations. And the procurement regulations don't allow for an amendment to be made after the expiry of, of a limitation period. They allow for an extension of the limitation period. But if the limitation period is extended, then, then the, the amendment is still made with, within, the, within the limitation period. And, th and that is what Mrs. Justice Jefford set out in, in that case. Then in the, uh, the accessible orthodontics case, the, the, the court agreed 
with Mrs. Justice Jefford and, and ruled effectively in that case that 17.4 is not applicable. So in a scenario where the limitation period has expired on a new cause of action and the court has not granted an extension, then then it's not able to 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 grant permission under 17.4 the amendment for the amendments and the amendment can't go ahead. So that gives rise to the big issue then in these cases, which I'll talk about on the next slide, of 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 whether there is a new cause of action which arises from the disclosure. So if you move that that over, um, Marie. Now, now this is not a very uh, it's not a very clear cut uh, area of law the, the you have to go back to the the, the steamship mutual case, which was a, a construction case. And in that case, the court said that the different breaches of the same duty may amount to a new claim if they, they relate, for example, to different dif different defect claims on different different parts of, of a building. It, it's a question of fact and degree as to whether the the um there is a new claim or, or whether in in our amendment context these are just additional particulars of of, of, a, of an existing claim dng cars and essex police was a procurement case and that that was the court of appeal and quoted steamship mutual and found in that case that uh that, that a claim based on the disqualification of the uh of the claimant was different to a claim based on 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 an allegation of dishonesty against the police. So when the, that amendment was introduced, that was considered to be to be a new cause of action. And also the, the DWF uh, case is, is instructive. There, there the, the court um, found that the where an amendment moves the case on from one based on inference to one based on explanation, that, that is not a, a new cause of action. And and also said that there was no no hard and fast distinction between the equal treatment and transparency principle. So if the, 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 main, the main allegations in, in the original claim are based on breach of equal treatment, and then the claim evolves into to a breach of transparency, again, that may well not be a, be a new cause of action. And there are other cases that are worth referring to, such as Travis Perkins against Cathilli and the Corologic case. They're all very fact specific, but but worth looking at in, in, when you ever have this problem. You could move on to the next one. So accessible orthodontics. Yes, the, the case um, that, that uh, well, I was partially successful, but I, I lost on this, this particular issue. It was a CMC and there were various applications that were made. This was my, my first um, COVID lockdown virtual course experience. And it was quite a bizarre one because it was done by telephone. This was before the uh, Skype business became the, the vogue and the uh, the judge was having problems with his internet and accessing the bundle. So uh, I, I was giving him re references rather than sort of taking him through the, the case law. The the, uh, the defendant counsel had a toddler in the background and then his phone ran out of battery and he switched the landline. So it, it wasn't wasn't entirely satisfactory. But in essence, the, the, the it wasn't a con an extemporary judgment. The court took away the the, the written pleadings, which are of course the written the written submissions, which are of course very important on on these sort of virtual hearings, and and reached his view later. The, the this case was was a, about a, a dentistry procurement, which had taken place some eighteen months prior to the uh, to the CMC that, that that'd been stayed. The the core case was a was a failure to evaluate the tenders in a in a transparent manner. But, but but the original pleadings were, were very much based on the scoring of the claimant's tender. And the argument was that the, the claimant should have been awarded a much higher score and, and, and therefore awarded a contract. The, the defence then, apart from refuting the specific allegations, also made the point on causation that the claimant would struggle to bridge the gap between its score and the, the winning bid of score, which was a very considerable gap. The amendments, which were then not brought for um, for, for for a reason that I can't really explain, for, for until 18 months after the original standstill letters, were based on the facts which were apparent from those standstill letters. And those those amendments, they 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 introduced allegations as to the scoring of the the, the winning the, the winning bidder. So so they were 
factually different in nature to, to, to the original allegations, but they were based on the same stage of the procurement, they were based on, on, on the same legal principles. And, and the court, sure enough, held that this was not a new cause of action, that this was a further, uh, a further allegation as to the breach of the transparency principle in, in the scoring of bids. And, and therefore allowed the, the, the amendments. The, this was, was held to, to be a new claim. Now, significant perhaps, and the court noted this, was that the court felt that this issue as to the respective scoring of the two bids could arise in relation to the causation defence. And um, it, it's often significant to consider the, the defence as well as the um, as the particulars in, in deciding whether or not that there is a new cause of action. So you can move on to the next slide. However, in a circumstance where there is a new cause of action, and from the from the claimant's point of view, it won't always be very obvious in relation because these cases are so fact specific and, and a little unpredictable. It won't be obvious whether the amendments do give rise to a, a new cause of action and therefore trigger a, a new limitation period. So, so you do you do need to consider what what would happen where, if an extension was required, and the, the the practical reality of 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 amending after various rounds of disclosure is that it takes a while to read the disclosure and then it takes a while to to plead the amendments. Then you have to seek the, the consent of the other side. And by the time you've done that, the 30 days are almost up. So you're doing well if you can get the application into the court before the expiry, expiry of the 13 day, 30 day period. And that, and that is essential. You, you need to do that. But, but it's difficult to, to, to get it actually heard before the expiry of the 30 day period. So, so the first issue is whether if you lodge the application to amend, this is on the assumption or, or the possibility that there's a new cause of action which is which arises from the amendments, whether the court will then consider that, 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 that there to be a good reason to extend from the date of lodging the, the application to the date of the hearing. And the answer is, I, I think after perinatal, that that, that will be, will be a, a, a good reason, although the court will have regard to the procedural context as to, to what's been what's been happening in, in, in the interim and whether the, the 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 amendments and the application has been been brought expeditiously. The uh, under some of the old case law, particularly under Mr. Justice Aikenhead, there were some very strict tests laid out in in cases like Mamek and Turning Point as to, to, to the, the, the grounds for uh, an extension uh, under the procurement rule. But there does seem to be a, a moving away from, from that very strict test. Mrs. Justice Jefford said they don't need to be exceptional circumstances, there just needs to be a good reason. And Mr. Justice Stuart Smith in Amy against West Sussex, uh, referring to some of the old cases such as Matrix SCM, set, set, out, set out these considerations which could go to the question of whether there is uh, there is a good reason for for an extension. If you could move on to the next slide, Marie. <clears throat> In this particular case, the the issue of prejudice was important because there were effectively two claims, and and this this was about claims being brought at the outset. It wasn't about amendments, but there were there were two parallel claims. One claim, for one claim, an extension was granted because there was a standstill agreement entered into by the defendants, and that, that again was a good reason for, for extending beyond the 30-day period. And then the other, the other claim in parallel, there was the, 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 the standstill agreement didn't cover the full period of, of the delay, but, but, but the court said that it would be sterile and unjust not to extend time in those situations because there was no impact on the progress of the claims. So, th so this is a straightforward application of the, the absence of, of prejudice principle uh, in relation to consideration of, of extensions. And it, 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 in my view, that, that's very relevant to amendments because amendments made at an early stage of, of procedure prior to the CMC, there's very, there's very unlikely to be any prejudice caused, but by, by a slight delay, um, so, so that could well be a, a basis for, for an extension. Now, 
I have to mention the Riverside Truck Rental and, and Lancashire case because this this uh, is a case where the rules are, again are applied more strictly. It's again it's a TCC case, Manchester TCC. It's not about amendments. It's about the initial bringing of, of the action, and and in this case, notably, the 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 court wasn't swayed by the intervention of the Christmas period and seeking to explore alternatives to, to litigation, etc. The, the 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 claim was brought. Um, more than 30 days are after the, the the expiry of the limitation period, and but the court said here that the absence of prejudice is not a factor uh, in favour of an extension, which is which it seems to be completely contrary to the Amy case, which was decided um, decided a year earlier. Now the uh, no no a couple of years earlier, but but in this case of course that that you didn't have the situation which you had in Amy where there were where there were parallel claims and there was obviously no prejudice. In this case there was an obvious prejudice because it because if the the the, the limitation period was waived by way of an extension there would be a claim which would not otherwise exist. So in this case there was an obvious prejudice. So it, it I, I think in all of these cases it's important to drill down into the the facts and the details. To, to get under the skin of, of the statements made by the court. You can move on to the next slide, Marie. So what about, lastly then, I'm, I'm just sort of wrapping up. What, what about adding a new form of relief? Is that a new cause of action? The It's not uncommon for claimants, particularly claimants with, with, which don't have a lot of funds in, in relation to smaller procurements, to bring a set-aside action, but not but, but not seek damages in the first instance because they want to avoid the, the £10,000 issue fee. Now, if they then later fail to maintain the suspension, they, they're not left, left with any claim. So the issue is whether they can then add a claim for, for damages or whether at that stage that would be time barred because it would be more than 30 days after the, uh, the date when, the, when, when the, claim, the, facts, the, the facts gave rise to a claim. And the answer in Brace Yourself Against NHS England, another dentistry case, was that yes, they can they can later add a, a claim for damages. A new claim means a new cause of action, not a new remedy in respect of a cause of action already pleaded. And that was that was applying the uh, the old case of of Lloyd's Bank against Rogers. So again, a a useful case to refer to in certain circumstances. And then lastly, by way of conclusion, is this. Uh, is the approach in in Amy and and in in perinatal and accessible orthodontics uh, a more a new and more pragmatic approach to to making amendments um, uh, in light of the the limitation rules following disclosure? Well, I, th I think it it may well be. The Amy West Sussex wasn't about amend amendments. Uh, accessible orthodontics was, but there's definitely when you combine the the case that are on on extensions and Factors such as prejudice and the uh, and, and the accessible orthodontics case, I, I think there is there is a move perhaps towards a recognition that it is just more cost efficient to amend a claim rather than to issue a new claim and then to have to consolidate different sets of proceedings. However, you do need to consider very carefully whether um, whether the amendments needed following disclosure are are, are further particulars or or give rise to a new claim. Very often, it won't be obvious. And, and if consent is not given, it's important to 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 make an application within the 30 days and, and get it listed as soon as possible. And that application would need to be supported by by witness evidence, which shows not only the, the procedural context, but also the, the facts giving rise to the rather limitation period and also setting out the, the, the good reasons for for an extension. So that that is all I have to say, David. Back, back to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, it was a very bracing talk, if I may say so, and plenty to get our teeth into. Um, I hope you had a decent retainer. Um, our last speaker is Sarah Hannaford QC. Uh, as you know, it's mandatory at the moment. Uh, I believe it's in the regulations that all public utterances on any subject whatsoever include the phrase "these unprecedented times." Uh, so I'm pleased to say that Sarah's talk is squarely focused on both the legal issues which arise in public procurement and the challenges of advocacy in these unprecedented times. Sarah, 
Uh, thank you very much indeed, David. Yes, I am talking about procuring and litigating during these unprecedented times. And on the next slide, you can see my topics, uh, which are first of all, procuring during COVID-19. Uh, there's guidance, as I'm sure you know, being issued by the Commission and the Cabinet Office on how to procure your COVID-19 related requirements. And that guidance covers the negotiated procedure, the without advertisement, accelerated procedures and amending existing contracts. And secondly, I'm going to talk about litigating, litigating during the pandemic, about the pandemic and above all, litigating virtually. So what does the Commission guidance say? Uh, I've set some quotes out on the next slide from some of the introductory remarks in the Commission guidance. Um, some slightly surprising things uh, can be found in this guidance. Uh, the starting point, of course, is that uh, the Commission explains that this is a health crisis that requires swift and smart solutions and agility. Well, no surprises there, but what follows uh, may make you raise your eyebrows. Options and flexibilities are available under the EU public procurement framework. Really, I hear you ask? Uh, so much perhaps for the government telling us that EU procurement law is a thoroughly bad thing, bureaucratic and clunky. Perhaps that's not right. Uh, and the next quote, even more so, European procurement, public procurement rules provide all the necessary tools to satisfy those needs, uh, says the Commission, those needs including the supply, uh, supply services and infrastructure, which you uh, require of first necessity quickly. So that's uh, that's what the Commission guidance uh, says uh, in the introduction. Uh, you then come on to a number of options listed in the guidance, which start on the next slide. So first of all, uh, there is the option that we all know about and perhaps use less often than we should, the accelerated open and restricted procedures. So the open procedure reduces the time limit from 35 days to 15 days. The restricted procedure, of course, there are two time limits here. Uh, the first one reduced from 30 days to 15 and the second from 30 days to 10 days. Uh, you need, of course, a state of urgency duly substantiated to rely on these procedures. But if you're looking at COVID-19 procurements, uh, it's difficult to imagine that there would not uh, be such a state of urgency. The difficulty, of course, is that an accelerated procedure still requires you to go through the hoops required by the open or restricted procedure. You just have to do it faster. And in the middle of a pandemic, first or second wave, and I'll come back to the second wave later, there is very unlikely to be time for uh, this sort of uh, time scale or procedure. So what's the second option? Uh, you can find that on the next slide. The second option identified by the Commission is uh, should the flexibilities of should the flexibilities of the um, negotiated should the flexibilities of the accelerated procedure not be enough, uh, then you can move to the negotiated uh, procedure without publication. I think this is on the previous slide, Marie. And the negotiated procedure without publication may be used, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, insofar as is strictly necessary, where for reasons of extreme urgency brought about by events unforeseeable by the contracting authority, the time limits for the open or restricted procedures or competitive procedures with negotiation cannot be complied with. The circumstances invoked to justify extreme urgency must not in any event be attributable to the contracting authority. So uh, that's the procedure, uh, the, uh, the negotiated procedure without publication. What does the Commission guidance say about it? Well, it makes a number of points about urgency. Um, and again, you may have to suspend your disbelief whilst reading this section of the guidance. It says when you're looking at this sort of procedure, the EU directives do not contain procedural constraints, public buyers, uh, may negotiate directly. It then goes back to 
Uh, there are no procedural constraints. There are no publication requirements, no time limits, no minimum number of candidates or other procedural requirements. It waxes quite lyrical about this. It goes on to say no procedural steps are regulated at EU level. In practice, this means that authorities can act as quickly as is technically or fe physically feasible and the procedure may constitute a de, de facto direct award only subject to physical or technical constraints related to the actual availability and speed of delivery. So no procedural constraints. First of all, you can no negotiate directly. Secondly, and thirdly, you can phone a friend. Public buyers may also contact potential contractors in and outside the EU by phone, email or in person. Uh, and various other suggestions are made for how you uh, might need to get hold of uh, a contractor urgently. The guidance then goes on on the next slide uh, to explain uh, that COVID-19 does indeed or is indeed very likely to meet the requirements of the negotiated procedure without notice uh, where urgency is uh, the factor. So COVID-19 is an event uh, which says the Commission is unforeseeable and your needs must be considered unforeseeable. Secondly, it's likely to mean that the accelerated procedure deadlines are too long. And uh, thirdly, a causal link uh, between COVID-19 and uh, the need for urgency cannot reasonably be doubted, it says, for the immediate needs of hospitals and health institutions. So some very forthright guidance. Of course, that guidance came out in the early days. Careful thought will need to be given to whether procurements meet the urgency requirements if and when they're dealing with a second wave or planning for a second wave. And that, of course, will very much depend on what a second wave looks like and whether it is separate from the first wave. Now, there are, of course, some caveats in the Commission guidance, and we can see those on the next slide. Um, firstly, the urgency uh, has to mean that the deadlines for the accelerated procedure, I'm afraid I put a deliberate typo in here. I think I mean too long, not too short. But anyway, uh, you've got to be able not to do your, proce your procurement within the accelerated procedure deadlines. That's the first caveat. The second caveat, a contracting authority can negotiate with uh, bidders, but a direct award to a pre-selected contractor remains the exception, applicable only if one undertaking is able to deliver within the technical and time restraints. So you can't just phone a friend, you might have to phone two or three friends. And the third caveat, this procedure can only be used to meet immediate needs and to cover the gap until more stable solutions are found. So you can't rely on super urgency forever. Right, so that's the Commission guidance in a nutshell. The Cabinet Office guidance, which starts on the next slide, deals with a greater number of options. Um, so it doesn't just deal with extreme urgency. Uh, which I've just been talking about under Regulation 32.2c, it also deals with the possibility of relying on 32.2b, absence of competition and protection of exclusive rights. Uh, of course, all these uh, parts of Regulation 32 we've looked at over the years uh, before reluctantly advising that they don't apply to this particular procurement. In this new world, uh, maybe they do apply. Although, of course, care still needs to be taken. Uh, and then the next option after what is described as direct awards, and I'll come back to direct, direct awards in a moment. Uh, the next option in the Cabinet Office guidance is call offs from frameworks. Of course, no surprise there uh, that authorities should consider calling off from a, frame, a framework before taking the nuclear option of phoning a friend. Um, of course, beware that the framework needs uh, actually to be relevant to the requirement you're procuring. So you shouldn't be shoehorning any old procurement into an existing framework. But I said I'd come back to direct awards. The Cabinet Office guidance talks about direct awards. As I said a moment ago, the Commission guidance suggests that 
you can't just place a contract direct uh, with one pre-selected tenderer. Um, that's the exception, not the rule. So a little bit of care needs to be taken when reading the phrase direct awards because there may need to be a competition, but clearly not the lengthy and comple complex type of competition uh, which we all know and love. OK, continuing on the next slide with some of the other options given in the Cabinet Office guidance. Uh, accelerated procedures, I've talked about those. They're obviously covered in the Commission guidance as well. But then very importantly, and something that I have come across quite a lot recently, uh, contract extensions under Regulation 72. Can you just extend all your contracts saying we're in the middle of a pandemic, that's unforeseen, and therefore I'd like to extend this contract by another two or three years? Well, the Cabinet Office does urge, quite rightly, urge some caution here. Uh, it suggests do limit uh, contract extensions to what is necessary. Do make sure that there's a real link between uh, COVID-19 and the need to extend the existing contract. Suggestions made are, for example, staff being diverted to deal with other much more pressing COVID-19 needs or uh, possibly uh, key staff being ill. So you've got to make sure there's a connection. Also, uh, be careful to consider limiting the duration and the scope of the modification. But of course, multiple uh, modifications are necessary. Obviously, don't think, and of course, none of our clients would ever think this, that you can extend all your contracts during COVID-19 because you're happy with the incumbent. And that seems a very satisfactory way of proceeding. So uh, that was procuring. Uh, very briefly during uh, these unprecedented times. What about litigating during these unprecedented times? Uh, is there any litigation during these unprecedented times? Well, the first question is, are there any challenges to COVID-19 procurements? Obviously, uh, some bidders or potential bidders have inevitably been reluctant to challenge emergency procurements. Um, it doesn't seem like the right thing to do, but in, in some places. But of course, uh, there will always be some litigation. Rachel and I are currently involved in a complex challenge to a COVID-19 procurement, which is the subject of a part seven claim and a judicial review uh, against three defendants. And we've already had an expedited hearing, uh, sorry, a uh, virtual hearing, and there is going to be an expedited trial in September. At the moment, we don't know whether that trial will be in person or virtual. Uh, but in accordance with the uh, Appendix H of the TCC guide, the Part 7 and the JR are proceeding together in the TCC. Now, challenges to COVID-19 procurements raise questions about the meaning of the guidance and indeed the negotiated procedure uh, without notice in an urgent situation. The guidance says, so what does a lawful procurement look like? The guidance says, as I said a minute ago, there are no procedural requirements. Procurements can be done, it says at one point in days or hours. What does that do to the basic principles of transparency and equal treatment? Well, obviously transparency is of necessity lifted, uh, sorry, limited. Um, Compliance with the general principles of equal treatment and transparency, I suggest, must be judged in the light of what was feasible and practicable. What you would expect to do in a procurement that lasted a year and a half and was conducted in several rounds is rather different from what you can be expected to do in a procurement that lasts a few days. So that brings me to my final slide, I think, which is uh, virtual hearings. Um, Four months ago, had any of us ever heard of Zoom? I certainly hadn't. How many of us had done virtual hearings? I suspect not many. How many of us had done virtual hearings from our home? Very, very much fewer, I imagine. For the first two or three weeks of the pandemic, it looked like this was a challenge too far. And as Simon said, a moment ago at the beginning there were some problems and you can never legislate for internet issues which anyone uh, participating may encounter but the TCC and litigants uh, have risen to the challenge and now hearing sitting at home seem not only to be possible 
but somewhat surprisingly, I now view them as, and I expect you do, as quite straightforward. They do, of course, require a lot of careful preparation. So I thought it might be useful uh, to set out a few top tips that uh, I have for making virtual hearings work. Um, and I'm sure that you're aware of all of these already. Limit, limited documents is absolutely key if you're doing a virtual hearing. A thousand pages of inter-solicitor correspondence, however beautifully crafted, will not see the light of day in a virtual hearing, I'm afraid. Uh, second point, user friendly bundle. Uh, an interactive bundle where you can click through from the index is marvellous. A searchable bundle is essential. Bookmarks are a good idea. And I'm sure no one has made this mistake, certainly not since the early days, but it's really helpful if the bundle starts on page one rather than the PDF numbering being different from the pagination. Um, there is also a uh, huge need for cooperation between the parties when you're doing a hearing virtually with an electronic bundle. You cannot possibly have arguments uh, about two versions of the bundle. You can't serve two versions of the bundle. You can't delay delivery of documents to the court or there is a real risk that the judge won't be able to read stuff or will be very cross. Uh, late additions to the bundle can be a real nightmare and uh, reissuing of the bundles three or four times the night before the hearing is guaranteed to make the temperature rise. Um, taking and giving instructions, uh, another challenge, but again, we've all, uh, we've all managed to sort it out. Post-it note size instructions by email or WhatsApp work perfectly well, and judges, in my experience, are very understanding of the need for a small pause to find out what the answer to a question is. I'm sure you've all heard of the nightmare story, beware of offline discussions. The unfortunate lawyer who sent a message to that party's legal team only uh, on Zoom, I believe, saying a witness was lying and the message was broadcast to everybody, including the judge. I may have got some of the facts slightly wrong, but it's a story we need to be very aware of. Uh, be careful who you're communicating with uh, during the course of a virtual hearing. So what about the future? I'd like to think that we won't be sitting in our uh, kitchens or studies or wherever it is you do your hearings forever stuck at home in front of a screen. But I do wonder, given the success of virtual hearings, whether for some applications they are here to stay. Uh, they're quicker potentially, uh, they're potentially cheaper, and it is also potentially easier to find space in parties' diaries where you don't need to travel across the country to get to a hearing. Anyway, I've overrun my time, uh, and I think it's back to David. Sarah, thank you. That was uh, very illuminating uh, and um, reminds us that we are working in testing times as well as unprecedented times. Um, in a moment, I will turn to the questions which have been coming in uh, during the three talks. I'm afraid we won't have time to cover them all, but uh, we'll do our best to uh, to answer some of them. Um, before that, however, I have an announcement. Um, Keating has been delighted to welcome an addition to Chambers, who is joining us on this webinar on his very first day as a member of Chambers. Charles Banner QC comes to us from Landmark, where he has enjoyed an extraordinarily distinguished career in a number of fields, uh, including notably planning and public procurement. And despite still getting asked for proof of age when he orders a drink, has so many Supreme Court appearances to his credit that he has had to order a bigger wig. Um, <laughs> director Re quotes describe him as one of the best court advocates I've seen. None of us is in the slightest bit jealous. Charles, would you like to say hello? David, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm delighted to be joining Keating today uh, and in particular to be working with uh, your, or should I now say, our excellent procurement team. Uh, it's extremely exciting and, and how fortunate it is that uh, I can join you today for this brief uh, cameo role. Uh, it's great to see a number of familiar names on the attendee list um, for this webinar. Hello to, to all of you who I do know. I very much hope we can meet in person again soon and I promise I'll get a haircut before we do so. Yeah. Thank you. Charles, thank you. Um, and now to questions. Um, 
Can we start with with one which I think is directed to Fanula and, and Rachel? Um, it's from Anonymous, uh, and it says, does the discretion approved by the court in the rail case, which I, I think means the Secretary of State's discretion to decide whether to disqualify or not, uh, give contracting authorities generally wider room in which to determine whether a uh, competition is called for? I'm sorry, I said Fanula, I think I meant Sarah, because it, yeah, either of one of you actually might want to, to answer that, or indeed both. Well, I've got a really short answer, and I think it's just no. <laughs> um, because I don't think I think that the margin of discretion here was about setting the terms of the ITT and then what to do once um, a, a bidder had submitted a non-compliant bid and it's very fact and context specific so I don't think it means that you can all go off and um, uh, procure things without competing them uh, and I think that, that, that I'll hand over to Sarah at that point um, who has talked it um, excellently about the circumstances in which one may do that um, in, our, in these unprecedented times. Yeah, Sarah. Yes, I think I was looking at this from the angle of the Commission guidance and uh, saying one could go and phone a friend, but obviously if one is going to phone a friend, you've got to be very, very careful. So um, I don't think there's a very wide discretion uh, not to have a competition, but in certain circumstances, in these unprecedented times, there obviously is. Thank you. Um, the um, on the question of uh, the, again, this applies to to both of your cases. So, um, but do everybody feel free to chip in, including you, Charles? Um, this question is again anonymous. Both the rail and COVID cases are being litigated through judicial review as well as tort, and is this likely to become increasingly common? And I think if, if any of you has any thoughts, as particularly from the claimant's point of view, as to the merits and demerits of, of JR in the admin court versus uh, tort and presumably the TCC, that would be an interesting thing to include. Well, shall I kick off on that? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, I mean, there have, over the years, there have been a number of cases that are for uh, both three part seven and JR claims. What the TCCC guide has done is make life a lot simpler because the cases can just be combined and dealt with by one TCC judge and then the parties can agree how to do it. So, for example, uh, you can deal with the commission stage first uh, in the JR or you can roll it up and hear everything together with the part seven claim. What we did in the uh, legal aid agency litigation a few years ago was we dealt with permission uh, at an early stage and then we dealt with a number of issues that arose across uh, both uh, the JR and the Part 7 claims. So there are a number of options and the, the TCC judges are very proactive in deciding on the best way uh, to deal with cases where both JR and a private remedy arise. Will it arise more in the future? Well, of course, that all depends on what happens after Brexit. But I think we are all steaming ourselves for the possibility that there may be quite a bit more JR in the future. I don't know, if, Fanula, if you wanted to add something. Um, well, I, I agree with everything that Sarah has just said. Um, I certainly have found that there's been an increase in sort of dual claims in the last few years. And of course, we introduced the um, ability for the TCC ju uh, judges to case manage the JR case at the same time and hear it at the same time um, as a way of streamlining those sorts, those situations um, where previously a claimant found themselves in two separate courts with all the intended increase in cost and the potential for um, judgments which differed. So um, I think it was a very positive development where you have these um, the ability to, to claim both remedies um, and who knows what the future holds. Uh, um, and I think it would be a terrible shame uh, and an injustice if we were to move towards JR without preserving the right to get disclosure where the information imbalance is so great. Um, mm -hmm. Handing over to, to Charlie, I think now. Um, thanks, Fanula. Yeah, my, my experience too is, is that dual claims um, 
have have increased um, in recent years. I mean, Faraday, um, the well-known case I did in the, in the Court of Appeal, that was an example where we brought the claim both um, in tort and uh, under the regs and in uh, judicial review because there was a, an uncertainty about whether the claimant uh, was an economic operator. They were a joint venture partner and landowner, but the bid wasn't in their name. Uh, and so to avoid any satellite litigation, uh, we, we brought the claim uh, in, in both venues. Um, so so I, I agree with your experience. Thanks all three for illuminating answers. Um, I've got I'm going to ask two more questions and then I fear we'll, we'll probably have to close. Um, this is for you, Simon. I, for some reason it hasn't published, so I, I, I'm going to have to read it out. Um, the, the, um, the reasons for extension started off, as you, as you remarked, very narrow indeed under uh, Mr Justice Aikenhead. Basically, the claimant had to have either been in prison or hospital at the time when the limitation ex uh, period expired, but it, it's got a little wider. Um, do you think, for example, that there might come a time when a claimant might successfully say that the harm to the public interest, if a contract were to be awarded, uh, unlawfully under particular circumstances was so great that, that that was a good reason why the case should be heard? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. And thanks for that really interesting question. The um, the question goes not so much to amendments, because, of course, with amendments, you, the, 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 the decision is already being impugned. So and this is just expanding the claim. The question really goes to the, the initiation of, of the proceedings against the, the, the procurement decision. So so we're, we're we're in a situation where there is more clear prejudice to, to to the authority if if a claim is allowed after the expiry of relevant limitation periods. But um, the if if you take the, the the latest the latest judgment on this is the Riverside truck rental and His Honour Judge Ack QC made it very clear he had to deal with it, exactly this argument, and he made it very clear that in a procurement claim, um, as opposed to a judicial review. The, uh, the public interest is not a relevant consideration to extension. So that, that was his, his finding in that case. However, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure it's that, it's that clear cut. And, uh, and I, I could, have, could imagine situations where you, you, you may wish as a, a claimant to, to argue this point. The, the good reason is uh, there's a non, it's a non-exhaustive list of grounds that have been set out in the case law. And um, I'm not quite sure what the rationale is for saying that in a judicial review claim you can you, you can refer to the public interest and you can't in a in a public procurement claim. Yes, a public procurement claim is about is about money uh, and, and it's, it's about damage caused to the claim and it's a it's a claim based on breach of statutory duty. But public interest is relevant to many aspects of of procurement, not least the um, the, the applications to lift the automatic suspension. So I wouldn't rule out at all arguing in a in an appropriate case that that is on a judge air was wrong in in River Trump. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think this will probably have to be the last question, I'm afraid. And um, Rachel, um, just a very a very wide open question, which you can answer really with whatever you you honestly think. What if you had to choose one key takeaway from the rail litigation? What would it be? Um, I think it would be to um, get on top of the documents and confidentiality arrangements early on. Um, there were so many documents in that case and it made preparation uh, very tricky. So the earlier that we could, you know, the parties are able to get on top of those arrangements, the easier it makes it for the preparation more generally. Thank you. That's that's a helpful, practical point, isn't it? Um, I'm afraid that that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you very much for attending the webinar. I hope you found it illuminating and I and we all look forward to welcoming you to Chambers in the warm and pulsating flesh in the not too distant future. So with that, goodbye.